In spite of some of the arguments against Medicare for All, a poll by the New York Times reveals that major support for the single-payer system has increased. The poll was conducted in November and found that 55 percent of Americans are behind the proposal. That includes 81 percent of Democrats, 64 percent of independents, and even 28 percent of Republicans. Here via Skype to discuss the findings and the support Medicare for All has is Wendell Potter, former health care executive and leader of the Medicare for All Now PAC. Great to have you, sir. Thanks very much. First, tell people a little bit about your background, because you've been sort of a whistleblower on the health insurance industry. Tell, tell folks about all of that. Yeah, I worked for the insurance industry for 20 years. I worked for Humana and Insigna. I was head of corporate communications for the company Insigna. And I left after a crisis of conscience during the last time we had a, a, a debate on health care uh, in, in 2008. And I testified before Congress as a whistleblower against the industry I used to work for and uh, helping to pull the curtains back on how that industry really, really operates and how it's motivated entirely uh, by profits and does whatever Wall Street wants and Wall Street is uh, through that industry, you know, th that's what the industry really cares about. Mm -hmm. So I've been, ever since that I've been advocating for reform, I testified before Congress several times, I've written several books and, uh, and now as you noted, I this organization that uh, advocates for Medicare for all for businesses. So, Wendell, tell us a little bit about the work that you're uh, that you're doing now, this pack that you're involved in, and whether which of the candidates that you think has the best version of Medicare for all that's put forward. Actually, the two organizations. One is a 501c3 nonprofit, which is called Business for Medicare for All. We advocate uh, on behalf of businesses, uh, which and businesses across the country small businesses in particular, just can no longer afford to offer coverage to their workers. So our employer-based system of health insurance has been unraveling for quite a long time. Uh, we we make the business an economic case for Medicare. We can save a lot of money and unburden employers from the responsibility of offering benefits. And uh, I also had Medicare for All Now, which is a 501c4 organization, that uh, reaches a broader constituency with broader messaging. We make the, uh, the economic and the moral case for moving to Medicare for all. What was it that you saw in your time as an executive in the health insurance industry that was so troubling it caused you to speak out at great personal risk to yourself? I mean, you sacrificed your career um, that you'd been working on for many years to come forward and blow the whistle. What was it that you saw? You know, it was, there, there are a number of things that the insurance companies use to limit access to health care. We have this notion that health insurance companies facilitate access to health care. As I said earlier, the, 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 the primary stakeholder for these guys are their investors, their shareholders. And there's so many different things that they just do to avoid paying claims. Uh, they've instituted uh, a very aggressive prior authorization practice. They uh, are trying to limit utilization of health care services and take no responsibility for it. Plus, they have no ability to control health care costs, nor do they want to. The thing that really led me to walk away, though, was uh, uh, handling the, 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 the PR fallout around a young woman who in, in Los Angeles who had been denied a liver transplant by my company, even though it was a benefit that was covered under her benefit plan. And uh, someone 2,500 miles away uh, at Cigna said that he didn't think it was medically appropriate for this 17-year-old this girl, actually. Natalie Sarkeesian was her name. Uh, so he denied it, uh, even though her, her doctors said it could save her life. Um, the, the family took it to the media, and it became a big PR problem for the, for the company to the point that uh, the company capitulated and decided it would cover the transplant, but so much time had passed since the original request was made that she died, uh, just five days before Christmas. Uh, and I just didn't need me to, uh, to handle any more of what we refer to as high profile cases. That goes on every single day. It's only the occasional cases that reach the media, but that happens all the time. People should know that you may have insurance, but there's absolutely no guarantee that you'll be able to get the life-saving treatment you really need. So, Wendell, tell us about, you know, you have these two candidates that have endorsed Medicare for All fully, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. There's been some criticism of Elizabeth Warren's versions of Medicare for All that's being put out. As somebody who advocates for this system, what is your thoughts on, uh, on that transition plan that she put forward? You know, I think well, both of them have, have 
some version of transition to Medicare for all. Uh, in, in Bernie Sanders' bill, for example, this four-year transition, uh, and the House version is two years. So there are different variations, different thoughts on how to get there and how quickly to get there. I think that uh, uh, Cong uh, Senator Warren makes a lot of sense when she says that the first thing that needs to be done is to reduce the influence of special interest. And I wrote, uh, I've written a number of books. My last one was called Nation on the Take, How Big Money Corrupts Our Democracy and What We Can Do About It. And she is absolutely right, and so is Bernie Sanders, uh, that one reason it's so difficult to get to see meaningful change in Washington is because of the unbelievably powerful special interests, including the one, the industry, you know, the industry that I used to work for, insurance companies. Um, so, you know, her first, that out of the gate, she said she would uh, take some actions to reduce that influence. I think that's important. Uh, and um, she would gradually begin to uh, bring more people into the Medicare program with, a, uh, uh, I think, over a four-year period of time. I think it's, I think it, you know, whether, whether it's that approach or Senator Sanders' approach, uh, I think uh, both of them are, are staunchly, staunch advocates of getting to Medicare for all as soon as possible. We need to do that. We can't do incremental steps uh, for long periods of time because uh, it just uh, creates more and more cost in the system and leaves more and more people out. Yeah, I think the cons biggest concern with Warren is that you'd have to pass essentially two Medicare for all bills, something that seems almost legislatively impossible um, given the current structure of Congress. But I also wanted to ask you about the Affordable Care Act. Um, how do you think that it's done? I mean, the President Obama's approach was basically to bring industry into the negotiations so that he could get it through Congress. Do you think it's been successful? Do you think it was the right approach? I don't think it was the right approach. I think it was the approach that seemed to be most likely to succeed back then. This again was 10 years ago. Uh, even though there was strong support for Medicare for all, or as it was referred to largely single payer health care back then, uh, the conventional wisdom in Washington, certainly within the Obama administration and on Congress, was that you, you had to work with these powerful special interests or nothing would ever get passed. And there's probably some truth to that. I testified before Congress a number of times during that debate. And I, I spoke favorably and said that I thought Congress should ultimately pass the, the bill that became the Affordable Care Act. It does a lot of good. It did bring a lot of people into coverage. The problem is it left in place the structure of our healthcare system uh, that's antiquated, that's no longer working, and that is constantly driving up costs. And it didn't get us anywhere close to universal coverage. So it, it, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, and it was an important one, and it did bring, bring a lot of people into coverage. But we've got a long way to go, uh, and we've got to make sure that w the next time we do this, that we're not letting the lobbyists for the insurance companies, the drug companies, the big hospital companies, and the American Medical Association write big chunks of the bill, which is exactly what happened. Hmm. Well, Wendell, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Really interesting. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We'll have more rising right after this.